Wilson with Coastal Carolina Fishermen. Today we've got with us Captain Mike Hoffman of Corona Days Charters. He's going to talk to us today about fall fishing for trout. Now, I, I tell you what, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I don't know it, it nearly as much as uh, Mike does, but I'm certain we're going to learn an awful lot. Uh, I, I tell you what, I've got to tell, tell everybody a, a short story here about Mike. Um, and, and I mentioned this last time he did a, a, a seminar for us. I used to charter fish myself and, and after that did fishing. And one day I was out fishing uh, back in a, a behind one of the Barrier Islands and um, I noticed this guide over here and he and his people on board just kept pulling redfish in hand over fist. Well, we're not more than 200 feet away and we're catching nothing. I mean, I think we get a flounder or undersized flounder or something like this. Well, this guy, I mean, they're just like as fast as I can pull them in the boat. And these were some really, really slot sized, nice redfish. I look at the side of the boat and it said Corona Days. Well, had to be Mike Hoffman. So that was the day that I really realized the knowledge and experience that Mike had. So I kind of pursue him on a lot of these things. But uh, Mike, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk to us about fall fishing for trout. Not a problem, Sam. I enjoy it, buddy. Well, listen, you know, it, it's that time of year. I got a couple questions before we really get down to, to looking at bait options and, and tackle options and things like this. Why does it? Why is trout fishing always better? It seems in the fall months. What makes? What are the elements that make it better in the fall? Uh, probably mostly the water temperature is uh, has a lot to do with the way it is here. You know, in the river bait, they seem to tend to stay there more um, in the summer months. But when that water temperature gets down below seventy degrees, is really um, what triggers them here at the beaches, you know, topsoil and right soil, and, you know, you get further up toward the new river, they don't move up in the river systems um, more in the summer months, but there ain't nothing like fall trout fishing. I mean, that's that's just the, uh, just like the trout come in the same time you can get oysters, and uh, my favorite time of year. Uh, you know, it, it's great. And don't, don't you find the bigger ones coming in in the fall months? Is that not pretty much the case? Well, there's an early run in September, um, and mid to late September will drill big fish, and then you'll see some of the um, smaller ones come in, you know, the um, 16, 17-inch fish will come in, and then toward uh, um, Halloween has always been the day to fish for me for real big ones also. Um, seems like that moon just triggers the, the real bite, you know, the bigger fish, but um, early, early in the morning before the sun gets up in September, the last two weeks of September seem to be um, really great for trout fishing also, especially the bigger fish. I got you. Now, I hear a lot of people talk about uh, the salinity matters. I know I, I live up one of the, uh, the larger rivers, a good many miles away from actual salt water. But it does get it is brackish water. But I noticed that on when it rains and it kind of washes away the salinity, that the trout fishing drops. But when we've had some dry days, the trout fishing up the rivers tends to be better. What what's your conclusion on this? What's your thoughts on it? Well, I think that uh, well, I mean, I know you can mark them, even though that the, the um, they're not biting, they'll find that firmer climb, no matter you know what the salinity is. There's always a temperature change and um, a salt content change, and you say in 10 feet of water, there could be three changes. And those fish will find, you know, suspend or sit on the bottom wherever that uh, thermocline and the salinity is right for them, and they just won't eat because it'll be such a small area uh, for them to be in. And that's why whenever you start getting into um, a lot of muddier water and, uh, you know, a lot of rain, that trolling seems to be... Um, a little bit more um, the way to fish because you keep it in that small strike zone. You know, um, you can you know slow down or speed up, and when you get bit, to stay at that constant speed, and it'll keep it in that firmer climb that they're sitting in um, a little bit longer than uh, than casting it. Um, but they they stay there; they don't really move. I mean, if they're in the back of the creeks and you get a lot of rain, they'll move around, but. Um, you can still mark them in there. They're just not feeding. They'll be stuck on the bottom or in a thermocline somewhere. Um, around here, a lot of times what we have is too clear of water, and that's when the late morning or early morning and the late afternoon um, really comes into play on fishing for them. If you got crystal clear water, they're not like reds. It's hard to sight fish for trout. 
Okay. What, now, what are we looking for? What kind of conditions? We talked just about salinity and, and what kind of and, and clarity. You mentioned that it, it, they're not really good around the real clear water. What other conditions? Any kind of particular bottom or and what kind of environment do they like? I try to key on um, um, the first one or two creeks closest to the inlet, um, uh, closer areas to the waterway and underwater points and oyster bars. Um, is where I seem to do most of my best fishing at. If you have a hump that's close to a point or in a curve, um, and there's a lot of that stuff around there. If you find an underwater point with the current running across it, I mean, the, the trout eventually going to sit there. But, um, you know, the, the way it is around here, there's so many people fishing. you got to be finding those underwater areas that um, that isn't visible is the way to be productive, um, you know, not getting them beat to death. But I think underwater points are probably my favorite favorite thing. Oyster bars or or even just sand points are my favorite things to fish to look for to fish on. Okay, back up in the creeks. I mean, I know there's underwater points there, but are they are they pretty productive also, or do we need to stay a little bit closer out to the bigger water? Uh, I like to stay out closer to the deeper water. The creeks get beat to death. You know, late um, uh, parts of the year you can catch them in there you know after december january if um what's left is what i'll, I'll go key in on those fish there but I'm, I'm sort of like staying in between the waterway and the inlets um it's just for bigger fish i mean there's big fish in the creek sometimes but um you get a lot more traffic um with migrating fish around the inlets and those first creeks you know closer to the inlets you know by the waterway um, always fish moving through there. You know, there'll be a school there, then it'll be gone, and then you go back next day, it'll be a different school there. Um, trying to find a feeding spot on those migratory patterns is um, is a real good way to, to key in on them. They won't be there every single day, but when you hit them, it'll be a big payday for you. Right. Now, we, we talk about fishing in the fall. Let's let's uh, let's talk about year-round fishing for trout. They're one of the few species that you really can pretty much catch them year-round. Isn't that pretty much correct? Yes, sir. You know, in the summer months, they catch them in the river all the time. I don't do a lot of fishing for them in the river uh, in the summer months because it's so hot there. Um, I prefer to, you know, fish for them in the salt whenever it gets uh, a little cooler. Um, you know, I'm offshore a lot during the summer, but I have gone down there and caught them on top water, you know, around Ballhead Island, around those areas there um, in, the, um, in the summer months. But I just don't think it's half as productive and uh, um, larger species of uh, them uh, just seem to be around, you know, between September and December is my best month. Okay. That's kind of what I thought. That's what I found to be true, and I think you're out there almost every day, so you definitely know that it's true. Uh, we're looking at a guy here holding a really nice one up right at, right around the marsh grass. Do they go up in the marsh grass in, the, in those little tiny estuaries? Uh, uh, you know, are those any good spots for us, or are they, again, holding what you've already said a couple of times is looking for the, the, the bigger, deeper water? Well, on the flood tide, that's my favorite place to do. A good place to throw top water is in those little bitty, not the big creek mouths, but um, the smaller ones, uh, you know, five foot wide, six feet wide, little feeder creeks that um, that come out of the marsh are excellent top water spots on flood tides. Um, the higher the tide is, the closer to the grass I'll fish. Um, and it seems like they'll run up and feed, you know, and then start dropping back to those points. Um, but I really did on a flood tide. I mean, definitely that's a good top water spot or, or a spinner bait spot throwing those redfish magics at them and stuff like that. It's awesome bait to fish around the grass. Don't get hung up in if you can make a longer cast or something like that. Um, real productive on the, on the higher tides. Okay, great. Now, you know, before we get, I've got a, a shot up here of uh, of some jig heads and uh, some curly tail plastics here. But before we get to that, let's talk about the actual tackle itself. What are we looking at? What size, what type of line are we needing to use? Uh, and what what are you using? I never use nothing heavier than 10 pound mono. I don't use no braid. Um, I don't, uh, when it comes to stable trout, I'll use sometimes, it depends, you know, especially fishing around Lightsville Beach. Um, sometimes I'll go to six or eight pounds. I'll have five or six rods of different size test lines. Um, I try not to use over a three sixteenths um, jig head if I'm using the lighter the better. Um, you know, because they're looking for those baits to be um, they're looking natural with the current. You know, we got a lot of current around this area. Um, 
never over 316 so if I ever used for the special trials, but I try to stay under 10 pound test line, sometimes eight, sometimes six. Um, sometimes it's better to have three or four rods with different size test lines unless you're real familiar with the clarity of the water that you're fishing in. Um, you know, sometimes when it gets real clear, you got to go down to six. Well, I've got to ask a question here. You're talking about you're using mono. You know, popularity for braided is, is really, really big. It's gotten really big over the last several years. Tell us why you prefer mono for trout fishing versus braided. Uh, well, personally, uh, with charter-wise, you know, you never know who you're going to have on a boat setting a hook. You know, you could have a Hank Parker one day and, and I'm one of those type of people. When I set the hook on a fish, I mean, I, I set the hook on them. Um, the monitor has a lot more stretch than um, the braid does. That braid has zero stretch. And I love braid for redfish and several other species of fish. Um, but with trout, I like using a real limber rod and um, like a medium action, seven foot. And um, mono, it just has, has that stretch to it. And I think also with the clarity of the water, even though you use a leader or whatever, you know, mono leader, if you're going to be fishing braid with a 20 or a 10 pound mono leader, you might as well go straight mono. Got you. Okay. Now we're looking here at, at some blue water candy um, uh, jig heads. Tell us a little bit about that. And also over here on the other side, we've got those uh, uh, those curly tail uh, plastics. Tell us tell us why you've got those and prefer those. Uh, Blue Water Candy has really come to the top of the leaderboard when it comes to uh, the soft plastics and the jig heads are unreal. They got double clasp on them. You don't have to worry about them. We call it pulling your pants down. You know, when the lure comes off the hook, um, you know, you get a pinfish or something, come grab it and pull it off. Um, they got double clasp on them. They're, they really got the jig heads down pat. And those are the ones that I use for trial. I'm just old school. I don't like painted heads. I like those old school type jig heads right there. And they started making a bunch of soft plastics with swim baits and curly tails. And, um, you know, they're just now starting to get out good here the last six or seven months. But uh, they're awesome baits. Uh, you know, that um, a couple of the companies quit making the um, the Christmas tree color. And we Water Candy picked it up. And if you ain't got a bag of those in your, you know, in your arsenal when you're going trout fishing, you can just about hang it up. Um, when they don't hit nothing else, that's what they'll take. Um, but Blue Water Candy does now make those um, Christmas tree grubs, and uh, I'm glad they did because when they stopped making them, uh, gotcha quit making them. I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> yeah, Jody's bailed us out a lot of times with coming out with some great innovations or replacing some great innovations. Uh, oh, he's awesome, man. He's Blue absolutely Water. awesome. Yeah, he sure is. Uh, okay, well now we're looking we're looking at some chartreuse paddle tails, some more plastics here, and also the Strike King Redfish Magic. Now you mentioned that earlier. Now obviously this is it says it's a redfish uh, lure, but you're using this for trout also. Yeah, you can take those same uh, those same ones right there, and uh, I like using a Colorado blade for um, for redfish, and, and uh, Captain Lee Parsons is the one that showed me the trick on putting the smaller willow leaf blades on them for trout. And um, it's, a, it's a real, especially on the higher tides when you're fishing in the grass. I fish a lot of mirror lures, MRs, and top waters, and, you know, you get in that perfect spot, and there's a piece of grass floating by, and, you know, you get hung on it, ruins your stuff. Well, those spinner baits, when there seems to be a lot of grass in the water, um, trash and stuff, um, they don't do that. I mean, you can let them sink or you can pull them across the top. They're real, uh, just something that you need to have in your arsenal, you know, when you're fishing around structure or grass like that. Um, you know, it's hard to bring a mirror lure or something across the sandbar on a lower tide or that thing there. You don't have to worry about um, uh, hanging it. You can put any color on there you want if you're catching them on pink, you know, or if you're catching them on black. Um, you can put your favorite swim bait on there. You don't have to use the stock one that comes on them. Or you can build your own. Some, I mean, I've got a bunch that I've built myself at the house. Um, they, uh, they're pretty pretty um, versatile baits for trout and redfish. And the cool thing about it is most time when you're out trout fishing, you'll hang reds on it also. You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, I'm looking at these paddle tails over here. What? Uh, tell me, is that, are these your favorite colors? I, I'm looking at a couple of pinks and a white here. Is that uh, what you, you prefer to use? 
We have one of them as a ball tail of shad that's made by a company in Texas, um, Kelly Wigglers. And uh, those things are unreal. I tell you, for, for trout and for stripers, they are one of the best baits that I've used salt plastic-wise. Um, they have a lot more action when you're, you know, especially early in the season when the mullets are bigger. Um, they have a lot of action to them. And I try to use those early in the in the fall and as the bait dies down. That's, that's sort of what I've done. I put them in order as I use them in. Um, use the bigger baits in the early fall and then drop down to the smaller swim baits. Um, um, the bass assassins and also the blue water candy um, paddle tails that they make now. Um, as toward the you know the end of the season when the baits get smaller and almost completely gone. Gotcha. Okay. Well, now God, I can't believe I, I've got all these pictures of your tackle box here, man. You uh, you have stack after stack of these things in here. A lot of these are, are top water uh, lures. T tell us a little bit about what that arsenal is all about. Um, top water skeeter walks uh, is by far my favorite one to use at my top water. Every now and again, I'll take and I'll use some of the um, um, some of the you know, like a, a pencil popper or something like that. But um, the bright orange and the chartreuse and the uh, um, sea throughs are uh, are definitely my favorite baits for trout. I, sometimes I'll use the big ones again. I'll use them early in the season and drop down to the smaller ones. Um, you know, as the bait thins out, uh, you know, about mid-season, I'll have one of each tied on, you know, just to see what they're going to do. But the chartreuses and um, and the bright orange are definitely two of my favorite baits on those. Okay. All right, we're looking at another one here. We're looking at some. I think we we pretty much covered some of these. Uh, it looks like you got some bomber baits here and stuff like that, and it looks like some mirror lures here as well. So you just kind of you just you, you just try it out until you uh, you find the right niche, correct? Yeah, well, I've got my favorite colors that I use, but you know, I travel. I go to Florida and other places like that too. And I just there's different colors for different spots. You know, the river is definitely different colors, and um, on the mirror lures that um, TT52 and the TT21 are. Um, two of my favorites um, on the TT models, and I think there's also some pictures of some MRs on there. Uh, the MR17 and the MR18 are two of my favorite colors to use here. But you now, as you go to the river, you know, the Halloween color and the, the purple demon, you know, all those things seem to work there. So, I mean, the best thing to do is just go, um, you know, try it out. And you need to have an arsenal, though, know, when you're trout fishing, you know, how those things are. Um, it seems like every time I go and they're not wanting to bite, I'll have one lure left, and uh, that's the one they want that day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, let me ask you this. You know, we've talked about some lures here. I know that from time to time, things like live shrimp are popular. Do you ever use that? Or I think I know the answer, and I think I know why, but tell us what your thoughts are. No, I'm, uh, if I've got clients that are... Um, that are don't know a whole lot about fishing or just want to have fun, I'll take and catch some live shrimp. But personally, and with most of my clients, um, I'm all 100% um, artificial, just like with largemouth. I don't know, just it's almost like a um, a personal battle with those two fish that I've had since I was about five years old. And um, I just don't like using live bait for them. It's a whole lot more interesting, and they they'll eat them. You know, if you get on the right school of fish. Um, you know, you can catch just as many on artificial as you can live bait as long as you're on the school. Um, and, you know, the pinfish around here, you know how they are with live shrimp. And um, I just don't like battling that. But I think that if you get on the right school of fish, that it's ten times more productive to catch up on artificial than it is um, on uh, live bait. Yeah, and, it's, uh, and it doesn't take as much time to rig up that uh, artificial bait as it does to find that live shrimp either. So, uh, yeah, so I understand. yeah, that's right. Uh, it can be frustrating when you're counting on finding that uh, that live bait that you can't find it on those days. Now we're we're rigged up, we're ready to go, we're out there, and it's a nice day. We, you know, we're we're at the at one of your hot spots. I won't give your hot spot away because I saw you fishing that day. You weren't fishing for traps, you're fishing for reds, but. Now, tell us how we cast, retrieve, how, how we work the fish. Well, that's a good question. You know, it depends on what what kind of day you got. If it's a windy day, the, the more wind you got, it seems like the faster you can work it. And on a, um, you know, may have to be a slow roll 
um, on a mirror lure, you may have to just barely reel it just enough to keep it moving. Um, on those clear, calm days and on days when you got more wind, you can burn it just as fast as you want to. And um, you sort of got to play the um, the uh, weather patterns out with that. Um, I mean, sometimes you got an inch of get a gold tramp and itch it across the bottom inch by inch to get them to bite it. And the other day you can pop them just as fast as you can pop them and they'll come nail them. Um, it's just like a day-to-day -day battle on uh, you know the retrieves. And usually whenever I get on a charter, the first thing, you know, the first 10 or 15 minutes is I'll fish along with them and use those different retrieves to see what they're biting. And, you know, that way I can pass the information on to them. Okay, very good. Now, tell us anything else that you feel like that, that a beginning or uh, rather novice trout fisherman needs to know and needs to be aware of that will help them out a little bit. Uh, it's going to cost you a whole lot of money, and you'll be doing it the rest of your life once you get addicted. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of the one of the most addicting fish that I believe. I don't know. There, you can see in the in the dead of winter, you can see three or four others out there that be freezing cold, snowing, sleeting, and you'll pass them in the waterway, and you can tell who the diehard trout fishermen are you know, when you get out there. But um, patience is one thing, and you know, if you go and you don't catch them one day in a spot, you think they are, I mean, they move in and out. They can be in that spot on uh, any time of day, on any tide. Um, you know, do a lot of moving around. And, uh, you know, and use your depth recorder. You know, drive up and do cold mirror lures down the bank and really keep an eye on your electronics. And when you start seeing those jump ups, you know, use it. those are points that are um, underwater right there. And mark them, and after you throw them, if you catch a fish on them, you turn around and go pull up on the grass and throw at them with a grub and sort of learn the areas. And um, it's, you've got plenty of time to do it. You know, it's a lifetime adventure to uh, trout fish. It ain't nothing you're going to master in one or two years. It's going to be something that's going to be, you'll learn every single time you go. Well, now here's one last question, or maybe not the last one, but you mentioned a few minutes ago about trolling. Tell us about trolling for trout. I, you know what? I had a had an old guy from up at uh, up north tell me a little bit about that. I never did it before, but he's told me about. it. I was kind of intrigued with it, and it works very well. Tell tell us how you do it. Um, usually, as yes, I'll get a crankbait, um, uh, like a, we got some shallow diving crankbaits. Um, you know, you may go down two or three feet and put them if you're trolling down a bank and put the it on. Uh, like a swimming image is one of the one of those pictures uh, that you have there has a purple one in there. So it's almost like a spitting image, but it's got a bill on it. Um, put it on the bank side and then make a cast just as long as you can out on the um, um, deeper water side. And you know you'll have to have current for sure. That's the whole key. And um, um, the trolling is having the current. You want to go against the current just as slow as you can. And but moving, you want to keep it moving as slow as you can. And uh, there again, it's going to take you a while to master it. You want to stay off of the ledges and not, you know, stay. I try to stay in six, seven feet of water all the time. And but once you find where them fish are hitting on, uh, what depth they're hitting on, you got to keep an eye on your speed and everything. You know, it's sort of a coordination thing, but um, best thing to do is just go out and you know, have a good time with it, have a buddy out there where you can talk and sort of pay attention to what's going on. And I mean, no time at all, you'll, you'll figure it out. But uh, there again, it does take a lot of patience um, to uh, to get your coordination right with how deep your lures are dragging. Um, but the lighter test line that you've got seems to be um, the key to success on those also. And also with that, you, what you'll find is when you get one, there's usually a school there, right? You, you kind of want to hang around that one area. If you catch one trolling, you look back, because usually when you catch one trolling, he's coming right straight to the top. You see where he came to the top at. And then you turn around and you sort of make a, a visual point on the bank and then go right up current from it, you know, a cast a distance up current and pull up in the grass and turn around and start casting to them. And uh, you'll find that that'll be it's almost like a way to cheat to find them, you know, because like I said, sometimes they'll get in those summer climbs and you can't catch them popping, you know, you just got to find that right area, that one small area that they're going to be sitting in suspended. But once you figure that out, then you got it, you know, you just... And sometimes you got to keep letting line out. you got to reel line in to get them to go to certain depths. And 
that's why that crankbait works so good. The further back you put it, the further it's going to dive, and you can start out 10 feet back and then just keep letting the back until it dives down, you know, almost to the bottom. And um, the uh, mirror lures, they really don't, they don't dive. They more or less sink and suspend, so you really can't tell a whole bunch about where it's at except for with your speed or as to a crankbait, you can tell whether it's maxed out or not. And, um, gives you a little more idea about where they're sitting at. Yeah, I've, that was exactly, it was, it's a good technique to hunt the fish, basically, to find out where they might be uh, holed up or schooled up at. So, it, yeah, that's a great idea. And like I said, relatively new to me, but uh, obviously not to you. Uh, Mike, anything else that you want to share with us before we leave today? I believe that's it. Maybe uh, you know, guys take your kids fishing this fall for trout. You know, I don't think it's a great thing for everybody to get their youngins out on the water, and uh, you're seeing more and more of it nowadays. Uh, um, you know, that's why I got me and my grandfather taking me, and I've taken my son. And I love to see guys out with their children on the boat, and uh, that'd probably be the most important part of it. Just make sure you got somebody with you to enjoy it with. You know, I have to agree with you uh, very much there, Mike. And one thing I will have to say, too, uh, for those of you that maybe are just beginning fishing or even trout fishing, uh, a bit of advice I'll give you is give somebody, especially somebody like Mike, a call because, you know what, you can spend literally a couple of years trying to do the things that Mike has done for years. Uh, it's a lot of trial and error, and trial and error is extremely frustrating and expensive at times. So do yourself a favor. Book a trip with Mike, go out there, get an afternoon or a morning of, of really getting some firsthand know how. And believe me, you're you're going to that learning curve is going to shorten up an awful lot. It's just a great way uh, to learn that. Then when you want to go red fish, you give him a call again because believe me, I've seen how he, uh, I've seen how he red fishes and it's extremely successful. So th that's something people don't do enough of. I know that when I was learning to fish. I would go and, and I would try, you know do trial and errors with different kind of baits and different kind of casts in different places, but you can go with somebody like Mike and you know the next time you go you're going to be a lot more successful than you were the time before. So, Mike, thanks a lot for joining us today. We really appreciate your time as well as your expertise, and uh, good luck to you in the future. All right, Tim, I sure appreciate it, buddy. You're welcome.